tonight, Lord, and we pray that you just open our hearts and minds up to it, that not only that we receive it, Lord, but that we can apply it to our lives to be a shining light for you in a dark world, Lord. We thank you so much for everything that you've done for us and, and the many praises that we have and the couple that were mentioned here tonight, Lord, we just uh, we thank you for those, but we also want to lift up our prayer request to you, and we're so thankful that you that not only that you're a powerful God that can take care of these prayer requests and heal and, and forgive and, and guide and lead, Lord, but we're, we're thankful that you listen to us and, uh, and that you hear us when we pray to you. And we're just, we just thank you so much for everything, Lord, and just be with us during this time, be with the kids across the, across the little street here and, uh, and be with all the workers in that and just bless this church in a way that only you can. We pray most of all for the lost so they can know you for it's everlasting too late. In your holy name we pray, amen. All right, so we're going to be in 2 Kings uh, chapter 5, and we're just going to do the first 15 verses. I'll try to keep it real short. I don't want to waste a bunch of y'all's time. I know y'all probably, uh, obviously you got Jason, so you do a lot better than me on a normal basis, but uh, we'll try to keep it pretty short, and uh, I kind of titled this lesson, uh, I Don't Know, is what it's called, because when he called me and asked me if I could do something, I said, I don't know, so... <laughs> So we're going to learn it out. We're going to figure it out together. No, but basically, uh, I want to talk about, and this is a very popular story here. It's the story of uh, of Naaman, who was a who was a leper, and and his healing, of course. And most of y'all probably have read this story many a times, and probably could teach me more about it than I could teach you. But uh, I just want to talk about some things that some things that Naaman probably didn't know and how we can apply it to us today about things that we don't know and what we need to do pretty much. So uh, when I teach a lesson also, if y'all got any input or anything, do not feel free to cut me off or say something. I, I love learning just as much as I like teaching, so you're not going to hurt my feelings at all. The, uh, I asked Jason, I said, do they, do they participate a lot? I said, can I, can I make it more like that? He said, if you want to, it's up to you. They do whatever you want to do. <laughs> so... Uh, but uh, we'll see that. So thinking about things I don't know, does anybody here ever get frustrated with things that you don't know how to, don't know what to do? Is that not just absolutely, I mean, that just blows my mind. When I can't do something, it just aggravates me to death. And uh, I tell you, I was working on uh, my truck. I had an oil sensor. Uh, my oil sensor went out on my truck. And it took me three and a half hours to change it. And I'm watching video after video, trying to figure out how to change this oil sensor. I'm, I'm laying over top of my engine because it's in the back, and I don't have a lot of nice tools or anything. And my wife will tell you I don't work on cars. And uh, I finally got this thing changed to figure out I did it wrong, so I had to redo it. So I spent another 30, 45 minutes redoing it, but I knew what I was doing that time, so I got it done a little bit quicker. But uh, I went about two, about two months after that, I went and got my oil changed at, the play, at the, this place in Oliver Springs. And I told them, I said, I said, I needed y'all a couple months ago. They said, for what? I said, my oil sensor went out. And they said, oh, that's easy. They said, we can knock that out pretty quick for you. I was like, well, it took me three and a half hours. They said, surely not. <laughs> I said, well, how long, can, how long did it take you to do it? He said, 15 minutes. <laughs> I was like, good Lord. So, but when you don't know how to do something, it's frustrating, right? It's frustrating when you just don't know. You can't figure it out. And, uh, and it can be like that in our Christian lives, you know, Christians get the, the, the vision pretty much or what everybody kind of speculates when you're a Christian that you got it all figured out, you know, that you've just you got it all underway. But even as Christians, there's a lot of things that we don't know. There's a lot of things that we struggle on knowing or, or trying to figure out. And we can get stuck in places in our life that we don't know. So that's kind of what I want to touch on uh, tonight. So i got five different points for you. And... Like I said, I won't try to keep you too long, but we'll go through verses 1 through 15 here. And like I said, if y'all got anything to say, just let me know. You can cut me off. It ain't no big deal. You just say, hey, you're kind of boring. We want to go home. I'll be like, okay. So, uh, but uh, what we'll do here is we'll read a few verses, cover the first point, and we'll read some more, okay? So, uh, we'll first start off with reading uh, verses 1 through 4. So, starting at verse 1 there, it says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance into Syria. He, uh, he was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Damon's wife. 
And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is, to, that is of the land of Israel. So we kind of open up this story here with Naaman. He's a pretty, he's a pretty cool guy. He, he's a really good guy. He is uh, a captain of the host for the king, which is the highest ranking officer in Syria. So he is kind of like the top dog when it comes to that. Uh, it says that he's a great man for his king. And not only that, but we find out he's honorable and that the Lord had used him. It says that in verse 1, the Lord had given deliverance uh, by him into Syria. So we find out that the Lord has used him too, right? So, uh, and then we find out that he is a mighty man of valor. He's a mighty man of valor, which means two different things most of the time. One being a great warrior. He is a, he's a great fighter, so he's highly respected and honored in that. But the second one being that he was probably a very wealthy man. And thinking about him being the king's highest ranking officer, he probably was pretty wealthy. So he has everything going for him, right? This guy's got everything, but he's got one additional thing. And that's where that wonderful but statement comes in at the end of verse 1. It says, but he was a leper. He was a leper. So aside from all these great things that he may be, he's a leper. So he's like, it's almost like it's overshadowing him, you know. And, of course, some of you may know leprosy is a very big deal during this time. This is a very serious situation, a very serious case. Um, it is totally incurable. There's no cure for it. There's no medicine they could take or nothing like that. The only answer was literally to abandon yourself away from everybody. Just remove yourself. So lepers, this, as serious as it was, and it would spread, and them having to abandon themselves, you know, they had laws in place. Even uh, God's people in Israel, you know, when they entered a village or a city, they had to holler, right? They had to holler, I'm a leper, unclean, unclean. So they would clear out the city roads so, these, so a leper could come in. And uh, it's funny because when you study this, a lot of uh, Christian doctors today think that this is absolutely amazing because they had no technology or anything like that. And for God, they just says this, is, this proves God, that God gave the direction to separate those people because if they stayed, it would have spread and just got to everybody. So they said there's no way they would have known how this disease worked or anything like that. So Christian doctors today think it's absolutely a miracle in itself that God gave this responsibility of kind of moving these people away. So, and that was the only way to keep it from spreading, was to just separate these people. Uh, you know, it isn't really, in these first four verses, it isn't real spe uh, specific on his lifestyle. But if I had to guess, it would probably be pretty weird. It would probably be a pretty weird lifestyle. Uh, you know, just thinking about how great he is and, and, and how honorable he is and his, his ranking and everything. But he's a leper. It's really put a kink in his lifestyle, most likely. Because I'm sure, well, as we know, we don't have to be sure, everybody likes the guy. He's a great man for his king. His king loves him. We're going to find out even more how much his king does love him. But, uh, but not only that, but, and I'm sure everybody likes being with him, but do they really want to be around him? Probably not, right? So this has really, really messed up his, his lifestyle. So, and I, you know, it also doesn't state here how long he's been a leper. So, and that's something I wondered and I was curious about. But, you know, if you kind of take these context clues into, into play here, he was probably a leper for quite a while because everybody really knew about it. It wasn't something that had just started. Everybody knows about it. The maid had just started working for his wife, and she found out pretty quick. So it wasn't something that he was hiding, right? So everybody knew this guy was a leper. And uh, so with that being said, it's clear that it's probably pretty clear given his situation, he doesn't know what to do. And that's, that's my first point. Sometimes I don't know what to do. And uh, I think he's in a situation here where he just doesn't know what to do. It seems as if to me he's accepted this style of living. He's just grown okay with this. He's, he's settled for this. Uh, I mean, what do you do? Can't be fixed. There ain't no medicine he can take. We just talked about that, right? 
He can literally just keep going on as if it's nothing. Or he can leave his wife, family, friends, lifestyle, everything, and abandon himself. So he doesn't have a lot of options. And thinking about his life, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do anymore. And you see, fortunately for, for him during one of their raids and battles, uh, they took a little Israelite girl captive. And she became the maid of Naaman's wife. And of course, she spoke of the prophet in Samaria, which we find out later is Elisha. He had a place to live there. So he stayed there. And, uh, but he could heal him of his leprosy. That's what she said. She said, he can heal you. He, she can, he can heal the master there. And this word soon traveled back to the king. But, you know, Naaman had to hear about it too, right? How come he didn't say nothing or do nothing about it? Naaman's wife knew. He had to know. It went, it, like I said, news traveled all the way back to the king before anything uh, was done about it or even mentioned of it. She went and told his lord. Part of me thinks Naaman, with him not knowing what to do, he's given up on his situation. He's given up on his situation. And, you know, and I, it makes me think as Christians today, can't we get like that? Not even as Christians, but people. Can't we get, like, just to a point where I don't know what to do anymore? You know, uh, the world has a disease, sin, right? The world has a disease called sin, and people are lost, and they don't know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, and they're out looking for anything that can fill that hole, Right? And they're out there saying, they're grabbing anything they can, and they're pretty much saying, I don't know what to do. I want to see if this works. I don't know what to do. Let me try this. Let me try this lifestyle. Let me try this drug. Let me try this alcohol. Let me try this friendship. Let me try, they're just looking. They're grabbing anything they can because they don't know what to do. See, since they don't know the Savior that can fill that hole in their life, they're looking at the world to try to do it. And really what they need to do is they need to know Jesus. And even as Christians, sometimes we hit a point in our life that we just don't know what to do. There uh, has to come a moment within your life that you got to admit to not knowing the answer, right? And I don't know if anybody's like me, I'm a guy, so I'm always right. You know? <laughs> so, but you got to get to a point where you just don't know, and you have to be willing to admit. I don't know what to do here. I don't have the answer to this problem or a solution to this. So sometimes you might not know, but God does. God does know. And not only does he know, but we need to, or when we, when we get to that situation and we know God knows, sometimes we just take it in our own hands still. We're like, yeah, we know God knows the outcome and knows the answer, but we just keep running with it. So the questions we need to ask ourselves is, are we patient? Right, my preacher just preached uh, this past Sunday, and if you're having a patience problem, he said, you know, you, when you pray for God for patience, he doesn't just give you patience. He gives you a situation that will make you patient, right? But do, are we patient? Another thing is, is are we ready? Are we ready when God gives us the answer that we don't know? If I don't know what to do and God's going to tell me, and then we're like, well, you know. I like here because in the story of Naaman, uh, his, uh, God knows what to do, and, and he tells them, he tells them uh, I talk about being listening, are you ready, and, and God don't know what to do. I want you to see Naaman's response when he talks to his king here because it's really good what we're heading into here. But uh, we have to be willing and be, and be ready to jump on it when God tells us. Now, and remember that when we read these next verses here. But uh, my second point is I don't know where to go. Sometimes I don't know where to go. And this is found in uh, verses 5 and 6. So let's read these real quick, starting in verse 5. And the king of Syria said, Go to and go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. So the, the king here quickly pulls him in as soon as he gets word. Grabs him immediately, and what does he tell him to do? Go. 
go and go. He's like, I'm going to send a letter with you. You can take it. You're going to take it to their king. And he just tells them to go. He loads them up with a whole bunch of silver and gold. And to be exact, it's 750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold. And then 10 changes of raiment. Now tell me that the king doesn't really like this guy to send all of this for Naaman to get healed. So he sends them with all that stuff. And the directions he gives Naaman just isn't real precise, is it? Just go to the king. Go, 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 go. Go to the king. Here's the letter. Go. He doesn't know really where he's going. He's like, oh, I'm just, he's starting out on this journey. He's embarking on, on a, uh, on a situation here, and all he knows is he's trying to go heal himself from this leprosy. He can go on to see someone that can heal him from it, right? So he doesn't really know where he's going. So he takes off, and he, and he goes, even though he's just really not precise. You know, where to next? I don't know where I'm going anymore. But, you know, what is, what is the struggle for us today of not knowing where to go? What is the struggle for us today? You know, people could have a whole bunch of problems. There could be a, uh, which we know people, I have a lot of problems, but <laughs> there could be sickness, disease, and, you know, we talk about prayer requests and people that's went through things, loss of a loved, loved one in a family, and uh, an addiction, maybe a loss of a job. Anything can happen in your life that kind of rocks your boat a little, right? And as soon as that happens, whatever, whatever it may be, whatever situation may come, Sometimes it leaves you in a situation where I don't know where to go from here. I don't know where to go next. Since this has happened to me, I lost my job. I don't know where I'm going now. You know, when you get in this situation where you don't know, and it's boom, it just happens just like that, and you feel lost. And when you start feeling lost, it's lonely and it's confusing to feel that way. And the problem is, is it gets to the point of you, when you don't know where to go, it, it's eventually going to get to the point that you start questioning all your past decisions, everything that you had done, mistakes you may have made, and then you get start blaming yourself, and you figure out in your mindset, you're like, I don't even care where I end up at this point. I don't even care where I end up. Just wherever the road takes me. That's a bad mentality to have. That's a terrible mentality to have. You know, for me, I was, a, I told you all a little bit, I was a deacon at a church up there on the mountain, and I was doing that for eight or nine years, and I was like, hey, I could do this my whole life, right? I was like, this is easy. Well, of course, God had different plans, <laughs> but, uh, which I guess I wouldn't take it back for anything. No, I'm just kidding, but God had different plans for me, but I got in a situation where some things rocked my boat a little bit, and I didn't know where to go next. I didn't know what to do, and I didn't know where to go. But when you don't know where to go, you have to follow God. You have to follow God in the steps that he has lined out. God knows the way, and he knows where to go next. And no matter what the instance is in your life, God knows the next step that you need to take. He knows the next step you need to take. You know, I told you uh, before we read these points that I love the interaction between the king and Naaman here because the king tells him to go, go, right? And what does he do? Grabs the letter, he goes. When our king tells us to go, we got to go. We got to be ready to go. And sometimes, you know what? We're not going to know where it's going. Uh, a year ago, I didn't know where I was going. Literally a year ago, I'm like, I have no idea where I'm going. And then he told me I was going to start preaching in October, and I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> so, but sometimes you just get in a situation where you don't know, but God does, and you need to follow him. Uh, Psalms 32, 8 says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the, in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. He says, I'll show you. I'll instruct you. Isaiah 58, 11 says, And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be watered in the garden like a spring of water whose waters fell not. He knows exactly where you need to be. He knows where you need to go. So when we don't know where to go, we need to follow God, right? So let's go to my third point. Look, we are zooming through this. We might get to go play with water. I don't know what time that ends, but ain't, we might get to go play in some water. Third point is found in verses uh, 7 and 8. 7 and 8. So in verse 7 there, it says, And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, 
that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive? That this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy. Wherefore consider I pray you and pray you and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard what the king that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So the point we get from this is I don't know who to see. I don't know who to see. So I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know who to see. And as we find out here real quick, that the king, uh, the king was not the person to go see. Uh, you know, it starts out in verse 7, uh, the king is, of Israel is just an abs- absolute distraught by this letter. He, he rends his clothes. He claims that he can't heal anyone. Well, of course he can't. No, no man on earth has this power of doing this, right? Not even Elisha. It's the power from God that is given through them, through the Holy Spirit, by God, and, and what can do this. So no person on earth has this power. Only God can do that. Only the power of the Holy Spirit through man uh, can heal people. And power is given by God for this specific purpose. So 1 Chronicles 29, 11 says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. And that, third, and that second point is power, the power. You have the power, God. So the king of Israel was ultimately worried because he thought Syria was looking for a war. He thought they were looking for a battle. He said, he sent me Naaman, his highest ranking officer, and he wants me to heal him of his leprosy. And if I don't heal him, he's just going to come fight me. That's, what, that's the conclusion that he has come to. So he is, being, he is just really worried in this situation. And all I can think about is put yourself in Naaman's shoes. How awkward is this? Right? He's come, he's come up to him here, and he's given him this letter, and he's read it, and he's rent his clothes, and he's shouting, and he's making a big deal. And Amos like, man, I don't know who to see. I just was told to come here. I don't know. Look at me. I'm a leper. I, I brought stuff. You know, I, I, brought, I brought a reward. So he doesn't know who to see. He just doesn't know who to see. Now, and he's trying to tell him that. He said, I was told to come, so I did. I'm just trying to figure all this out was probably Naaman's mentality. I'm trying to figure this out just as much as you are, buddy. <laughs> That's what he's saying to him. But luckily... And thankfully that Elisha got word of this, right? Elisha heard about this, and I love because he questioned the king of why he acted so foolishly pretty much. And uh, in verse 8, he asked him, he says, Wherefore have you rent, rent your clothes, rent thy clothes? Why have you done that? He said, like, that don't make no sense. Why, why are you acting this way? So he, he asked him about that, and then he tells him to go ahead and send Naaman this way. He said, send Naaman to me. And I love what he said here. He said, so he will see that there is a prophet in Israel. Now, that's really important. So notice that he didn't say, so I can heal him. Send him this way so I can heal him. He didn't say that. He said, that there's a prophet. He said, send him this way so he can know there's a prophet in Israel. So he knows that someone here is on the main line with God. So he can know the power of God and what he can do to people and through people. That's pretty much what he's saying here. He's like, I'm just a prophet. I'm just a messenger from God. Don't send it to me so I can heal him. God's going to do that. I'm just the messenger. So I loved his response there. But, you know, and in 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 applying this to our everyday life, can't we be just like Naaman? Sometimes we enter a situation in our lives where we just don't really know who to go see about a problem or a situation. You know, uh, we, we can be in that, and I don't know who to go see about this certain thing, whatever it may be, but we often run into problems where we don't really know who to look to. And you see this in a lot of younger people today because they think they can find the answer on the Internet or, or their friends at school. Because, you know, we've never lived that. We've never been that age. We were born this old. So <laughs> why would they ask any of us, right? So... So you see that a lot in younger people, but I, even myself today, I'm getting older now, unfortunately. But the uh, but we get to a problem where we just don't know who to who to look to for things, but we go to the wrong people for things. 
We go see the wrong people, and we, we seek world answers pretty much. Uh, my pastor talks all the time about the world's wisdom versus God's wisdom, right? And guess what? You can go to the world's wisdom, and you, can, you might learn a thing or two. But I promise you, it's only going to put a Band-Aid on it. It's only going to help for just a little while. If you look at God's wisdom, He can give you permanent healing. He can give you something that will just pretty much blow your mind out. It's above imagination here. And we're about to get to that point because it's about to be totally crazy what Naaman's about to experience. But we, we like to go see a lot of people that don't have the answer when we should be seeking God because he has the answer to everything. You know, when you're in a time of need, think about it, who do you go to? When you're in a time of need, who do you go to? Is it a faithful friend? A faithful friend, someone that's in church all the time. If you miss a Sunday, they're going to call and see what's wrong. Like, hey, I missed you this week. Is it a willing church member? Maybe a church worker or something like that that you know has knowledge of the situation or, or has been through this before. Uh, is it a preacher or a pastor or, or for young people, a youth minister or whatever it may be? Is that who they're looking to for advice? Is it God? You sometimes open the Bible and, and read because I'm going to be honest with you, this covers a whole bunch of stuff. People have been through everything in here. And it tells you exactly what you need to do. Are we seeking after those things? Are we seeking after God and, and the people that he has put within our lives? Because he's lined people up in our lives to, to guide us in the right direction and lead us in that right direction. You know, uh, God has supplied our lives with his knowledge and he has put people in our lives to look to. But uh, like I said again, the problem is we go to those people that don't have that insight. You know, there's, there's a lot of things you can refer to. And I know I harp on the Internet and stuff a lot, but sometimes they think a psychiatrist might just fix all their problems. Or they think this counselor, you know, my, this counselor can fix all this stuff if I just go see this counselor. I don't, I, this will take care of it. And it's like, well, I'm not saying it won't. No, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But if you ain't asking for God's help in those situations, then... I, then it's probably not going to be a permanent fix. You know, uh, I've heard the phrase before that, well, this is something that my, my pastor and God can't really take care of. That's wrong. You know, and I'm not saying your pastor or whoever it is is going to have all the answers, but they should be able to help you out in a spiritual standpoint and help you out spiritually to get you through those things. Uh, 1 Chronicles 16.11 says, seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. Not just seek his face once or for one problem. Or If it's real big, you can see him for this. If, or if it's real small, you can maybe bring this to his attention all the time. Everything, continually. Isaiah 41.10 says, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea. I will help thee, yea. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Seek after me, is what God is saying. Seek after me. So, point number four. Point number four is going to be in verses 9 through 12. Verses 9 through 12. And that, this point is, I don't know if I can trust this. So we're going on this journey. Sometimes we get to a point, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know who to see. Now I don't know if I can trust this. Because Naaman's about to get what, he, what he's asking for, but... We're about to see he's got, some, he's got some regard. So starting at verse 9 here, it says, So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. He got mad. He got real mad. Right? See, Naaman gets all of his stuff. He gets his chariots together. He gets all of his people. And he takes off to Elisha's house at the beginning of this. 
He's going to see Elisha. He's going to get healed. It's pretty exciting stuff right now. He, now he's kind of got some more sense of, I know what I need to do. I need to go to Elisha's house. I know who I'm seeing this time. I know where I'm going. It's all good. We got this figured out. You know, this is what God wants, right? So he heads over there. But instead of coming out to see Naaman, Elisha just sends a messenger to the door, pretty much. I can imagine Naaman, you know, knocks on that door, and uh, he's waiting to get in. Probably, I mean, you've probably never seen the guy before, probably. And he's waiting, and the messenger, I just picture him just cracking that door open. Not really. He's like, hey, just go to the Jordan. He said, just go to the Jordan seven times, and you'll be good. Washing it, dipping it seven times. Well, that made Naaman very angry. Verse 11 says he was wroth, you know, and luckily I don't ever get that way. But, uh, but he continues to say, I figured he at least would have come out and seen me. I figured he at least would have come out and talked to me, right? I made all this journey. He goes, does he know who I am? Oh, he's got a lot. He's more than just too proud. He, he's got a little bit of pride. <laughs> he's a very prideful man. He's like, I'm pretty much the second in command in Syria. He goes, you know what I could do this place? If I went and got my Syrian army. He goes, and I've won. I've won battles is what he's saying. Right? He gets upset. He says, I thought he'd come out. And he says, I thought he'd come out and he'd call on the name of God and he'd strike his hand in the air over me and he'd heal me. Well, not only was he prideful, but I think he was a little bit after the theatrics. A little bit, right? God doesn't always work in a theatrical way. Am I right? I mean, sometimes it's little things like this. So he was wanting to do that. He thought it would just be this great big thing, but instead it was just, hey man, just go jump in the river seven times. Just go get in the river seven times. That's all you got to do. And if getting in that old muddy river would do the trick, then why couldn't he have done that back at home? He talks about the rivers of Farpar and, and uh, Bana and Damascus, where he's from, and just how much better they are. I can wash in them. Why can't I do that? His thought process here is, I don't know if I can trust this. What a silly thing to do. You know, and sometimes when he, now he's got, now that he's got everything together, you know, we talked about not knowing what to do, where to go, who to see. He's got all that now. And now he's got to the point where we're like, well, I don't know if this will work. How can I put trust and hope and faith in this? How can I do that? And, you know, uh, I find it funny because if you actually, if you study about, and I've read some scholars and stuff that's went over there, they say that the rivers of uh, Farpar and Damascus, and uh, Abana in Damascus are just absolutely beautiful. They flow from the mountaintop, and they say they're just absolutely gorgeous rivers. And then they turn around, and they do tell you that the Jordan River is extremely dirty, nasty, muddy. It leaves much to be desired for. The Jordan is not a hot spot. You, don't, you ain't going there. It ain't nothing to write home about. So he's really making some logical sense here when he's, when he's talking, but it's logical sense, not God sense, right? So he's got he's to get those in a one-track mind here. But, you know, God gave him very clear directions. Elisha gave him very clear directions, right? He said this right here. He says, go to a specific river, the Jordan, right? He said, perform this action, wash in it, and do it this many times, seven times and you'll be clean. And then he gets mad and turns away and walks off and leaves in a rage. Now, does anybody here think, other than me think that's just absolutely crazy that this guy would do that? Didn't want to humble himself. You know, I think that, and, uh, and I, as much as I want to kind of beat Naaman up here, how often are we the same exact way? God just gives us something real specific to do. Like salvation. Doesn't get any easier than that, does it? It's too easy. <laughs> Just like salvation. Just like you sitting there praying and saying, I, I wish God would, you know, I want to do something. Use me, Lord, whatever you want me to do for me. And then all of a sudden somebody's like, hey, would you teach this Sunday school? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not. You want me to fill in on a Sunday? You've lost your mind to teach Sunday school class, you know. And well, you've been asking for it. And sometimes we're like, well, I don't know if that's going to work. How can, how can just trusting and having faith in somebody eternally save me? It doesn't make sense all the time, does it? It doesn't make sense all the time. But we have to trust in him. While he's saying, I don't know if I can trust this, and sometimes we can do that, it has to come to the outcome that you are wanting God 
and we have to we have to kind of put, put ourselves aside and say that we don't know better than him because that's the mindset that we try to get. That's the mindset that Naaman has, his prideful mindset. He didn't want to humble himself. He's like, well, my rivers are better. I'm not going to do this. I deserve better than this, right? But I don't know if I can trust this. That, that's what goes through our minds sometimes. We have to learn to lean on him. Uh, Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. We know all things work together. But sometimes we're like, well, not all things. Maybe just one thing. If, you know, if, he would, if he would at least let me have it and do it this way, you know, we try to haggle sometimes. We've got to fully trust the situation, that process that he's laying out before us. Psalm 37, 5 says, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Trust in him, and he'll, he'll take care of it. Trust in him. Trust, trust, trust. He, ha- he knows the way and he has the way. Point number five. Point number five is found in verses 13 through 15 and uh, touches on what you just said a second ago. I don't know why he saved me. I don't know why he saved me. So let's, let's read these verses and let's talk about this. Starting in verse 13. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all of his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. So as he was leaving in his rage and, and running away from this, it says that one of his servants came and stopped him. They held him up for a second, right? They said, whoa. They said, if this would have, you know, they said, we know this doesn't make a lot of sense, but if it would have been some great thing you had to do, huge journey that you had to accomplish or, you know, go slay some beast, like, you know, it's some theatrical thing. You would have done it. That's what they told him. They kind of called him out on his pride here. They said, you would have done that. But this little simple thing to just go wash and be clean, you you don't even want to try it. You don't even want to humor it for a minute or think about it. You're just going to leave away mad and run away from this. And, you know, I like it here in, uh, in verse 13. Also, if you look, they call him father, which would actually be really weird for a servant to call him father, but it, again, it shows the reverence they have for him. They have a lot of reverence for this guy, a lot of respect, and, uh, and a lot of honor towards him. They really look up to this guy. They sincerely care about Naaman. You know, like I said, I want to give Naaman a hard time, and I want to, I want to hit him for his pride and everything, but he's really a good guy. He's really a good guy. So they call him father. They sincerely care about him. So he listens to their advice. And he takes that stroll down there, and he washes seven times in that nasty, muddy river that he didn't want to get in. And just like the prophet said, he was healed. He was completely healed. Not only was he completely healed, but it says that his flesh was like a little child. He was like overhealed. He was more than enough, right? Talking again about how God will go further than anything you can imagine. You know, he probably thought he'd at least have some scars or something. It's like a newborn baby. You know, have you ever touched a newborn baby, that skin? Just precious. That's how he, that's the skin he had. Brand new. Brand new flesh, like a little child. Just absolutely, just a beautiful miracle here. And there is a distinct difference in him. A distinct difference. You could tell it. But then he makes that trip back to Elisha with his company. And you know, his trip on the way down to that river before he got, before he got cleansed from his leprosy, you know, I would say that was a pretty, a pretty awkward trip. You know, his servant had to talk him into it, and he's probably marching down there to this river, and he's like, I can't believe I'm doing this. You know, yeah, I'm going to do it for you. 
probably real mean, prideful again. He says, I, you know, he's just mad, and all of his servants are like, God. At this point, they're like, golly, I hope this works. Because <laughs> the trip back to Syria is going to be rough. <laughs> if this guy doesn't get cleansed of his leprosy. Man, what a terrible trip down that river it must have been. But you know what? While that might have been a weird setting, and he started dipping in that river, and I like to think he probably was like, that's number two. That's number, he's probably calling them out. That's number four, three more, and I'm looking the same. And that goes to show that you have to be obedient to God because it didn't say wash five times. It didn't say wash six times. It was seven. So he had to do all seven. He could have done it the fifth time and been like, this ain't going to work. I'm getting, I'm getting out of here. Right? And his servants were like, just two more times. Just two, just two more. Just two more. And that seventh time he comes up healed. Completely healed. Distinct difference. Skin like a baby. Right, And while that trip down might have been really weird, can you imagine that trip back as a healed man? Him walking up there, he probably didn't say nothing. He's excited, I'm sure, but you know, his, all of his servants are giving him like, told you so looks, you know. I've been wrong before. My wife's let me know. I get that look. But he gets that, I told you so looks. Yeah, you, I told you to dip in that river seven times. You better be lucky I stopped you. You'd be halfway to Syria by now, you know. And he's like, man, he goes, I can't believe that. But think about, he was probably ashamed. He was probably absolutely ashamed of the way he acted. That he took God's direction and just threw it away like that. And I think this thought, I'm speculating things here, and you might be like, Jason, this guy can never come back. He speculates way too many things. But I wonder if it crossed his mind. I don't know why God saved me here. For the mindset I had, for the way I acted, how I treated his plan and his direction for me, and how I treated my servants in this situation. Why? Why did he still do it? Why did he still do it? You know, I, I think that's amazing because... Sometimes I feel pretty ashamed, even as a Christian, you know, and, and it crosses our minds a lot today. But I don't know why God gives me time of day, and I know nobody's perfect and everything, but sometimes I question, I don't know why God saved me. And you hear the same answer all the time, because he loves you, right? Because God loves you. That's why he saved you. And it, I'm going to be honest with you, I can't fathom that amount of love. I don't know. You can't measure it. You know, there ain't no yardstick big enough to, <laughs> to dip down in there and measure God's love. But, man, I'm sure glad he does. I'm sure glad he does. You know, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, I guess I could have gave you all these scripture references too. Sorry, I didn't think about it. <laughs> but, uh it says, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but because he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Not because we love him, because he loved us. And we can't measure that love, but he loved us. And I love that because you see the love of God in this story here. And the way you see the love of God in the story here is the healing of Naaman was special in itself. It was special all, all in itself. Luke 4.27. Luke 4.27. This is Jesus speaking. And I want you to look at what he says here. He says, And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elysius the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. It says that there was all kinds of lepers. Where at? In Israel. That's God's people, right? In the Old Testament. Full of them. How many got saved? How many got cleansed? One. Why just me? This is the only one. I love that Jesus points that out because I don't think anybody else would put that together. Yeah. 
he's the only one. He's not even from there. He's from Syria. Naaman the Syrian is the only one that got cleansed. Elisha performed many miracles. I think 14 to be exact. You might want to you might want to fact check me on that later. Let's well, not point it out right now. <laughs> but out of all of his miracles, he healed one leper. That is the love of God. And I'm sure Naaman wondered all the time, why me? I don't know why he saved me. None of us are perfect. We fail in so many ways, but God still sent his son to die for us, for everybody. No matter, no matter the amount of bad things you do or, or the past you follow or whatever it may be. He died for everybody. And it ends here with Naaman in the end of verse 15. He says, Now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. He knows God's real now. He knows God's real. If you continue reading through this chapter, you find he's taking dirt back with him because the dirt he thinks is holy and he's going to go pray on it so he can pray on it. This guy has changed. But I love that he says that, that there is no God in all of earth but in Israel because if we go back to verse 8, when Elisha was like, I want him to know that there's a prophet in Israel. That's exactly what Elisha wanted him to learn. He said, that's exactly what I want him to learn. I want him to know that there is a prophet in Israel. He said, that's it. I just want him to know that God's real and that God loves him and can heal him and take care of him. And that's exactly what he took away from it. It's exactly what he took away from it. You know, his, he, he was healed and his eyes were open to God. But, and I, I know talking to the Wednesday night crowd and talking about being saved, but is our eyes on God and what, and what he's got for us? I, we don't know everything. Sometimes we don't know what to do. Sometimes we don't know where to go. Sometimes we don't know who to see. Sometimes God lines it all up for us on a yellow brick road, and we're like, I don't know if I can trust this. I don't know if I can do this. But guess what? When you finally take that step of faith, and you do it, and you see that he carries you through it, you're still left questioning. I don't know why he done it. I don't know why he saved me. There's a lot of things we don't know, but God does. We have to continually keep our eyes on him. We don't know what to do, turn to him. We don't know where to go, follow him. We don't know who to see, ask him. Look to him and his people that we know that's close to him. You know, there's problems I can go through. I know who to call on. There's some people I call on. There's some people we wouldn't, let's be honest, right? <laughs> there's some people you wouldn't ask for advice. And if it comes to, I don't know if I can trust this, we've got to have faith when God shows us the way to do it. Because some things are scary. Even in the church, sometimes it's scary doing new things. You know, uh, the church I'm currently at right now, they're talking about building a new building. That's a scary thing. It's, it's a money thing. It's a big thing. I don't know if I can trust it. I don't know if this is really going to work. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. But you got to have faith that God's going to take care of it. And if you're ever curious why I don't know why he saved me, it's because he loves you. It's because he loves you. So that's all I got. Anybody got any points or anything to make? I'm sorry to waste a lot of your time. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Um, but uh, again, I just want to say, uh, really privileged for the opportunity again to to be here. Um, and I'll think I'll go find Jason if I if I don't get wet. Uh, <laughs> I'll try to I'll try to dodge that. But I just want to thank y'all for the opportunity and coming and listening and and everything. And uh, I'll be uh, praying for y'all. And uh, it looks like y'all got a really good thing going here. So. That is awesome. You can't pull in many churches and sit many kids outside. Not many at all. So it's a blessing. Take your blessings and run with it. So uh, if nobody's got anything else, let's stand and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer, okay? So, Dearly and Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for this day that you've given us, Lord, just this time to be in your house to uh, just to give you worship and praise. Thank you for your word and what it can teach us and show us and and Lord, I pray that we have faith to follow it and, uh, and to study and dig deep into it and follow your steps and where you want us to go and what you want us to do, Lord. And we know that if we look to you, that 
you'll, you'll give us an answer. If we ask you, you'll give us an answer. If, if we knock and try to open a door, you'll open it for us and you'll show us what we need to do, Lord. Give us the faith to trust in it and to follow it, Lord. And I thank you for the salvation from it. I thank you for eternal salvation, but I thank you for taking us through our daily things that we struggle with, Lord. And, and if we do have faith in you, and we come out the other side just wondering why. We know it's because of your love for us, Lord. And we thank you so much for that. And I know we can't measure it or, or uh, put, a, put a stamp on it and telling us how much it is. We're just so thankful for it, Lord. And I pray that you just be with us all. Lead God and direct us as we finish out this week. Be with this church. Just bless them and be with the many prayer requests that were mentioned here tonight. It's all in and we pray in your holy name. Amen.